morning. My name is Jane Dorman and I am a part of the teaching team here at White Oak. This week we are going to talk about what it means to reframe our friendships and dating relationships. But before we do that, let's recap what we've learned so far. Week one, we explored the idea that if we continue to get love wrong, we will never get Christianity right. The Bible's definition of love is a supernatural, mysterious concept represented in the full character of God, because God is love. We cannot give what we have not received. Week two, we celebrated singleness. We challenged the cultural narrative that singleness is a disease with our big idea. Every single person is a single person with a purpose. You don't need a significant other to have significance. In our singleness, we have the opportunity to discover who God created us to become and cultivate our purpose. If we want to love our neighbors as ourselves, we need to learn to love who we are in Christ. Which leads us to today's topic, how to actively pursue relationship with others, specifically in the realm of friendship and dating. As parents, Brian and I believe in the importance of allowing our kids to explore different extracurricular activities so they can discover their hidden talents as well as learn how to be on a team, develop friendships. So our five-year-old Patrick recently expressed an interest in gymnastics, so we signed him up for a local program. One day, while we were waiting for class to start, Patrick noticed another little boy sitting nearby. He confidently waved hello to him. Timidly, the little boy waved back. What's your name? Patrick asked boldly. Damien, he mumbled. Hi, Damien. My name's Patrick. Do you want to be best friends now? Damien's face lit up and his aunt and I exchanged knowing glances as Damien nodded his head in agreement. And the two ran off to class, leaving us adults in amusement over the innocent exchange that we just witnessed. Don't you wish making friends were that easy? Let's face it, relationships are messy. Our culture tells us that more is better. If you want to be acceptable to society and need to be popular and pad your circle with as many friends as possible, same goes for dating. We're encouraged to date recreationally. Date as many people as possible before you get tied down so you can gain experience. Today, our big idea is to pursue relationships with purpose. Who and what we surround ourselves with is who and what we become. The choices we make in our relationships, good or bad, have the ability to change the course of our life. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. God makes it clear throughout Scripture that we are not meant to do this life alone. However, he gives us wisdom in our pursuit because not all relationships are created equal. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. We need to find a balance between being available and engaging with the many, but keeping the circle that influences us intentional. The voices we allow to speak into our life have the power to influence how we live out our purpose or 
could potentially derail our purpose in its entirety. We are going to do an activity that will give us a picture to help us reframe friendships. So grab a pen and some paper and follow along. First, draw a large circle and label this casual friend circle. Your casual friend circle are people you interact with on a regular basis based on the circumstance or season of your life. This includes coworkers, neighbors, school, etc. They aren't there by choice per se, but you interact with them consistently. Who has God placed in this circle based on your current season or circumstance? And write those names down. Next, I want you to draw a smaller circle inside the casual friend circle and label this one close friend circle. These are friends as a result of your choice. In your life, this could look like a life group or a book club or golf group or a mom's play date group and the like. Sometimes these friends can be a result of the first circle. These are the people that you are choosing to engage and do life with that can influence how we grow in our relationship with love. Who is in this circle for you? Who are you doing life with? And finally, draw a smaller circle inside the close friend circle and label that one core friend circle. These are friends that are chosen through wisdom and trust that has developed through your relationships from the close friend circle. The people we allow to come close into our lives have a profound effect on how we walk in our purpose. Who currently resides in this circle? In his ministry, Jesus actively demonstrates all throughout the Gospels how to discern this different friendship circle. He was available and compassionate to the many in the casual friend circle. He selected 12 outsiders to do life with regularly, the close friend circle. And out of those 12, he chose three with wisdom to encourage and grow in relationship with them in the core friend circle. Jesus knew the importance of doing relationships well. So take a moment and look at these three circles and the people in your life. Who currently resides in these circles? And after you determine that, ask yourself, do these people belong in that circle? Who have you allowed into your close circle that is not encouraging you in your purpose? Is there a toxic person in your core circle that you need to release? It's important to take note of who resides in our friendship circles because if we're not careful, their influence could directly affect our process of becoming. Remember Proverbs 4.23, it says this, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. We need to pursue relationships with purpose. Friendships should not hinder our forward motion, and neither should our dating relationships. Now, I would argue, as we look at these circles, that dating relationships fall into the close and the core friendship circles. These are people we choose to go deeper with. Now, dating, it's a relatively new concept, heavily influenced by American culture. And if you do a deep dive into the Bible, there are no explicit instructions or dating advice, but we find wisdom in scripture and accountability through the church. We have a responsibility as a community to think collectively to encourage our single brothers and sisters in their dating pursuits. Married people in the room, if you are in a healthy marriage relationship, You've got wisdom to share. In fact, if you're married in the room, could you raise your hands? Raise them high, don't be shy. Okay, keep them up. If you're single, dating, engaged, I want you to look around the room and see all the potential mentorship and discipleship partners we have here at White Oak. Pursue them. Married couples, if you know someone who is single, or dating, or engaged, pursue them. Invite them out for coffee, or share a meal together. The truth is, 
You don't need a special degree to have an impact in someone else's life. God is writing our story, and he made those stories in our lives to be shared with others to reveal God's glory. Okay, so those who may be single in the room or dating or even engaged, I want you to listen up. While the culture tells us that dating is recreational, we need to realize that dating is a temporary relational phase. When we intentionally date, it sets us up to hit a relational target, which is marriage. Intentional dating is purposeful because it's driven by a clear goal to determine whether the person you're dating is right for you to marry. So who should we date? Well, for starters, I highly recommend pairing this book with this book by Pastor Mike Todd called Relationship Goals, who says a dating relationship isn't going to bring glory to God unless both people are following God. Now we see this idea written out in scripture found in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. And I love how the message translation puts it. Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership, that's war. Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? But that is exactly what we are. Each of us a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way. I'll live in them, move into them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise. Leave it for good, says God. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. It is impossible to have a flourishing relationship that glorifies God if both parties are not on the same page foundationally. One broken person plus one broken person equals two broken people looking for love in all the wrong places. If we want to cultivate healthy relationships, we need to keep God at the center. Now, as we approach dating through this lens, I want to share with you four things to consider as we reframe how to date. Number one, intentionality. Proverbs 16, 9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So how does this help us date intentionally? This verse makes it very clear. We need to take action. We need to stop complaining how all the good guys are taken, or, well, that girl's a six and I'm looking for a 10. You fill in the blank of whatever excuse you have to stay inactive. If there's someone that has come across your path that you may want to get to know better, make a plan and take an active step. Going first, it's scary, but it's brave and, dare I say, attractive. Now, there is a debate as to who should go first, the boy or the girl. While tradition dictates the boy asks the girl out, ladies, we are living in the 21st century now, and biblically speaking, Ruth went and got her Boaz, and so can you. Single men out there, that doesn't get you off the hook either. I'm just saying. But back in my single days, I was the girl who dug her heels in waiting for the guy to make the first move. Yes, love is patient, but the agony of sitting and waiting for the phone to ring because you don't want to miss the opportunity to find love is a waste of your time. When Brian and I were in the friend zone, he was the first guy who casually in conversation said he wished more girls realized that they had the power to initiate. I think he was fishing to see how I would react because we were still trying to figure each other out. But I picked up on the hint and later suggested we go out and see a movie. It's time to stop sitting and waiting for love to happen. And it's time to take action and initiate it with intention. Okay, so number two, clarity. Clarity is kindness. As we move forward, we need to be clear with our intentions with the person we're pursuing. We need to stop playing games with each other when it comes to defining the relationship. 
Every relationship consists of two individuals created and crafted with care by God. God desires us to see unity together in the body of Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that if you're dating someone and it doesn't feel like the right fit for you or there's no chemistry that you stick it out because you don't want to hurt their feelings. But it does put a responsibility on you to be clear with the other person so they understand the status of the relationship. Ephesians 4 talks about the unity of the body of Christ. Paul encourages us in verses 15 and 16, which says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Something I have always appreciated about Brian from the very beginning of our relationship is his clarity. Even when we were still friends, there was a clarity of interest between the two of us. And when we decided to make it official, he was clear with me about how he felt. He was willing to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is a risk we have to take if we want to experience connection. Be clear with each other and stop playing games. Number three, strategy. This is where you get honest and ask yourself, is the person I'm pursuing aligned with my God-given purpose? I remember when I was fairly young, I knew in my heart I had big entrepreneurial dreams for my life. When I started dating, the first couple guys I dated were really good guys, but our dreams didn't align. They were good guys and I feel blessed to have known them, but that didn't mean they were the right fit. Being good is just one factor to consider in your dating relationships. You need to have a strategy in your dating relationships because if you aim at nothing, you gain nothing. So when you bake a cake, for instance, you have to follow the recipe using all the ingredients to get the desired product. You can't build a flourishing dating relationship just off of one good ingredient. One ingredient does not a cake make. So if the reason you are in a relationship with someone is because he or she is a Christian or has a good heart or plays guitar and knows all the quotes from the movie, What About Bob?, but has different goals for their lives that don't align with your God-given purpose, it's okay to take a step back to reconsider. Another thing I wanna address is your strategy with boundaries. Now, I know it can be a buzzkill, but I'm gonna say it. Save sex for marriage. It's worth the wait. Make up for lost time. God will bless it. In the love passage we looked at in week one, it says in verse seven that love always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. When you are dating someone, you want to observe to see if they echo this posture of love. Ask yourself, are they protecting me? Do I trust them? Do I have hope? Are we both persevering in this relationship? If your answer is no to any of these questions, you may need to rethink your strategy. If you date recreationally, you run the risk of derailing your path to purpose. What is your strategy for your dating relationship? Does your partner want what you want or are they just along for the ride? What is the motive and posture of their heart? Number four, timely. This is the point where you ask yourself, is this the right season for you to be in a dating relationship with someone? Ecclesiastes 3.1 tells us, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Everything in this verse includes our relationship. When we rush into dating relationships at the wrong time, Heartbreak is not far around the corner. Rushing leads to ruining. Be honest with yourself and consider, is this a good time or a season 
to be in a dating relationship with someone right now. Pastor Bianca Juarez Altef has a formula for reference to help determine if it is the right time to date. Right person plus wrong time equals wrong. Wrong person plus right time equals wrong. Wrong person, wrong time equals wrong. Right person plus right time equals right. When we use these four ideas to reframe the way we approach dating, it helps us to determine whether the relationship is moving you forward or weighing you down. God cares so much for you in the choices that you make. He has worked too hard for us to just throw in the towel on our purpose for a mediocre relationship that is convenient and not potentially covenantal. I think the biggest challenge facing dating couples is keeping Christ at the center. When you date someone with the intention of finding a potential life partner in marriage, you want to make sure you are equally yoked and growing in the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind as we reframe our relationships. If we get love wrong, we will never get Christianity right. If we get singleness wrong, we will never get friendships or dating right. If we get dating wrong, we will never get marriage right. If we get marriage wrong, we will certainly get divorce right. It's a domino effect that starts with reframing our concept of love so we can do relationships better. All throughout Jesus' ministry, we hear this message over and over again. Be careful who or what you tie your soul to. Let me pause here for a second and make this very clear. Sex is good. Sex is God's idea. He designed it. But God-honoring sex happens within the parameters of the marriage relationship. In fact, many scientific studies now show that sex outside the context of marriage messes with our brains because when we have sex, you form a connection or a soul tie with that person. If we pursue these relations recreationally or casually, it messes with our psyche so much so that it can steal our purpose. I know the response to our conversations about sex in the church can dig up feelings of shame, and I want to apologize for that. Church, we need to stop shaming people for their choices. Shame does not help, it hurts. Shame is a powerful emotion that tells people they are not enough, and that's when we isolate and hide. We need to engage and encourage and love like Jesus did. You are never too far from the love of God. While sin is the thing that separates us from God, Jesus came to earth and did something to fix that. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are healed from any sin. God's love is unconditional, and he desires for you to come back in relationship with him to find forgiveness and healing. So today, if you are here and you feel this, maybe you've tied your soul to someone or something that's hindering you from stepping into full life with God. I want to pray this passage of scripture over you from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. And I pray the Holy Spirit stir within you and release you from shame. I pray that out of this glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever 
and ever. Amen. Friends, as we wrap up today, I want to encourage us in our reframing of relationships with a couple action steps to practice this week. First, I want everyone to take some time this week to examine the friendship circles we observed today and list out who in your life currently resides in these circles. Ask yourself, do these people belong in the assigned circle or do I need to readjust? Then, I want you to take a moment to consider what relationships in your life are present but underutilized. Secondly, it's time to take action. I want to challenge you to reach out to one person this week and invite them to get together. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe you've been dragging your feet to ask that special someone out on a date. Maybe you're married and need to reconnect with your spouse by going out on a date. Whatever the circumstance, I challenge you to go first and actively pursue relationships with purpose. Remember, if we wanna be a people that help lead others to full life in Christ, then we need to keep love at the center of all we do. Together we move, God bless you.